Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Camila Abels. I am a senior program officer at the National Academies Board on Natural Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the first public meeting of the study committee that will be conducting a review of current knowledge on grapevine viruses, grapevine red blotch virus, and grapevine lethal associated virus type three research outcomes, gaps, and future research approach. So this study is being done at the request of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Now I turn it over to the committee chair, uh, Dr. Anna Whitfield. Thank you. Welcome to this first public meeting of our committee. Um, we're here today to um, further discuss the focus and the boundaries of this task that's so important for California grapevine. And so today we're going to be going over some questions that have been generated um, after reading the task um, and um, introducing the public to the members of our team. So can we go to slide two? So we're going to be doing our introduction and then we have um, submitted some questions to our, to our panel. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to my vice chair to introduce himself. Um, and then we'll go over the other panel members that are present in this meeting. So slide three, thank you. Alex? Oh, I was muted. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. My name is Alex Karasev. I'm a professor of plant virology at University of Idaho. Uh, I was involved in uh, studies, various studies of plant viruses for the past 30 plus years, and was also involved um, a little bit in uh, studies of uh, grapevine viruses since about 2008. Uh, I have a, a split research and teaching appointment here at University of Idaho and teach a graduate course on uh, plant virology. And that's probably it. I think Femi is our next panelist. Yeah, yeah. Ulufemi Alabi is my name. Uh, I'm an associate professor and extension specialist to the Texas a &M University System. I'm in the uh, southern, uh, you know, uh, station of the Texas A&M uh, University System. Uh, but I, I did my PhD at Washington State uh, under the direction of Dr. Naidu Rayapati. I worked on grapevine viruses, uh, looking at uh, genetic diversity and population structure of viruses in grapes, and also looking at um, impact of BIFRO3 on grape performance. Uh, but since I've been in Texas, you know, I've changed things a little bit. Uh, I still work on viruses, uh, but uh, most of my work is on, uh, you know, other fruit crops like citrus, uh, as well as vegetable crops. Uh, but the focus on virology is still, is still the same. And uh, recently I got, I started doing some more work on grape viruses, you know, working with colleagues uh, in the other parts of the state where, you know, grapes are grown. Uh, basically trying to figure out, you know, what are the viruses present in the state and, uh, you know, uh, what, what are the major threats and how can we mitigate those threats. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Oscar? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Oscar Batuman, um, citrus pathologist uh, with University of Florida. I have research and extension appointment, no teaching appointment. Um, in the past, uh, I always worked with uh, viruses and almost only viruses, uh, including uh, postdoctoral and project scientist period at UC Davis, uh, working on processing tomato viruses and other veget vegetable viruses. Uh, currently, I'm working the only on almost only on citrus uh, Hong Kong Ming disease, uh, citrus screening, um, and I have a very little side project on um, tomato infecting uh, viruses. That's all I have. Thank you, Oscar. Um, our next committee member, Libby Sinowitz, um, isn't able to join us today. 
but she's an assistant professor um, at Clemson University and she has expertise working with grapevine red blotch and it's um, hemiptran vectors. So she has some great expertise um, that's relevant to the work of, the, of this um, team. Um, Mamadou? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I don't know. So somehow my, my camera is not working anymore. Hi, my name is Mama Dufal from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, I'm a research scientist in, in uh, AFC and uh, associate professor at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, my work mainly on grapevine viruses uh, from virus detection to uh, modeling. And recently I started working on uh, a soil virome and how that can impact uh, uh, grapevine health. Thank you. Alana? My name is Alana Jacobson. I'm an associate professor of entomology at Auburn University. And I've been working on insect transmitted viruses for probably the last 15 years. I don't have experience working on any of the grape viruses, but I've got experience working on drips transmission of Tospa viruses, aphid transmission of poliroviruses, and white fly transmission of pagomaviruses. So just kind of well-rounded and majority of my focus works on vector transmission. Great, thank you, Alana. Our next um, committee member, Kirsten paul Silinski, is at the University of Florida. She's a professor of entomology and she works on um, hemiptrin transmission of um, uh, HLB, um, a very important disease of citrus. So that, that expertise definitely comes into play um, when we're talking about uh, perennial crops that um, support these uh, vector-borne plant diseases. Um, and then our next committee member, I don't think Wen Ping is able to make it either. And he um, studies grapevine viruses at Missouri State University. So he has a, a long history with that. And our next member that need, is here to introduce themselves is um, Naidu. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon. This is Naidu Rayapati from Washington State University. Uh, I'm currently professor in plant pathology. I am also serving as director at uh, Irrigated Agriculture Research and Action Center in Prosser, Washington State. Uh, since 2004, I have been working on grape viruses in Washington State, building a new program, addressing different aspects of viral problems affecting uh, wine grapes in Washington State. So my research focus has been uh, from, from identification of viruses to management uh, epidemiology, as well as molecular biology of viruses, especially leaf roll associated virus three. Uh, I have 30 plus years of experience working with plant viruses, not only at Washington state, but across many different countries, working on several different insect vectors as well as virus types, infecting a broad range of crops in uh, subsistence agriculture. That's all I have. Thank you, and I do. Stuart. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Stuart Wrights. I am a professor at Oregon State University and the director of the Malheur Experiment Station in Eastern Oregon. And I have been working on the ecology and management of insect vectors of plant pathogens, in particular with thrips and tospo viruses, but we've also worked on white flies, uh, psyllids, leafhoppers, so a variety of different uh, vectors, pathogens, and cropping systems. And I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Tom? Hi there. Um, this is Tom Turpin. I am uh, trained in plant pathology and worked half my career as a virologist in biotechnology. And the other half of my career, I've worked uh, more of a supporting role in both public and private contexts um, in just a wide variety of situations, including the Florida citrus industry. Um, and right now I'm working closely with UC Davis uh, 
on a small startup company. We're commercializing a chemical sensor, a little sniffer widget that has applications in agriculture for disease detection and uh, post-harvest quality amongst other applications. Thank you, Tom. So um, very privileged to work with such a great team of scientists with expertise that really addresses the task that we have in front of us. And, and I, I have worked with um, vector-borne diseases of plants, working with mites, thrips, aphids, plant hoppers, so a variety of different um, insect vectors. So we're really excited to delve into this task. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Camilla. Sam, can you show the next slide? Okay, so um, Matt and Chris and Steve, uh, please um, introduce yourselves. Tell us more about yourselves. Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, my name is Matt Kaiser. I'm an environmental program manager with the California Department of Food and Agriculture here. Um, I work with the uh, Pierce's Disease Control Program uh, and I'll uh, share more about that in a minute, um, but uh, uh, also work with the Pierce's Disease and Glassic Wing Sharpshooter Board that is uh, 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 funding and, and originally sort of uh, uh, sought out this, this review project. So uh, thank you all for the opportunity today and for the, uh, the chance to meet you all and your time. So thank you. Chris? Hi there, everyone. I'm Chris Lowe. I have been the research coordinator for the Pierce's Disease Glassy Wing Sharpshooter Board for about two years now. Um, otherwise, I'm an independent consultant in vineyards here based out of Napa. Um, my company is called Vine Balance Consulting. Uh, in terms of my academic background, um, I have studied plants. I studied plant science at Cornell University before going to UC Davis for um, a genetics degree. I worked with Dr. Andy Walker in rootstock breeding. And even though I ended up transitioning to the industry, I am passionate about science and so have been involved in the research community through, throughout my career. And I am very excited about this study and about having this um, committee take a look at all of our, our industry issues with grapevine viruses. So I thank you very much for all of your time. Steve? Steve here. I didn't see Steve on the current list of uh, attendees. Um, I can just mention uh, Steve has a, a been one of the, I believe, a, one of the original members of the PDGWIS board when it was first formed uh, in 2001. Um, he's also the chair of the board's research screening committee, which includes uh, board members and other uh, uh, scientists and uh, industry representatives and other folks that that are represent one step of the uh, uh, proposal review process uh, associated with the, uh, associated with the annual RFP. Uh, so he, he's been kind of our um, most directly interested in uh, research uh, board member since uh, uh, since the beginning. So ho hopefully he can join on uh, shortly. Thank you. And thanks to Matt, Chris, Matt and Chris for being here. Okay, so um, before I give the floor to Matt, I am first gonna give a brief overview of the National Academies and our study process. And this is just for anyone who's joining us today who may not be familiar with the institution. Can you go to the next slide, Sam? Okay, so um, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, uh, consists of three honorific um, academies. So the NAS, the NAE, and the NAM, which used to be the IOM or the Institute of Medicine, as well as the work of scientists across the country, inside and outside of these academies, who provide expert advice to the nation on issues involving science, engineering, and medicine. And our mission is to provide independent, trustworthy advice and facilitate solutions to complex challenges by mobilizing expertise, practice, and knowledge in science, engineering, and medicine. And we fulfill this mission through many convening activities, including consensus studies like the one we are um, discussing today. Next slide, please. 
So um, as opposed to other convening activities that we organize, such as workshops or forums, consensus studies are conducted by a committee convened specifically for a unique task. The experts who serve in these committees do so as individuals. They are not representing any organization or institution that they belong to, and they serve as volunteers. Consensus study committees review the state of scientific literature to write a report that responds to the problem identified in the statement of task. So here um, I have photos of um, three reports that we that came out of consensus studies. Uh, Pierce's disease was released in 2004, and this was and this report or that study was done at the request of CDFA, but that was before my time. So during my time, we released two reports on Sutus Green or Huang Longbing, and one was in 2010, the one in the middle, and then the one on the right we released in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to quickly go over our study process. And each, each consensus study goes through a number of stages or phases. And the first one is uh, on the left, which is we define the study and we develop the statement of task, or we call it SOT, uh, through conversations between us, the National Academies, and the study sponsor. And then next, the Next is the committee selection and approval stage. The National Academies asks for nominations to identify individuals with the necessary expertise to address the task. Each committee should be composed of individuals with the appropriate range of expertise and experience relevant to the task and contain a balance of perspectives on the task questions. The nominees are appointed to a committee by the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Marcia McNutt. Committee membership is provisional until the committee has completed a discussion about conflict of interest, disclosures, and composition. After being appointed, the committee moves into its information gathering phase. So this is the third box there. Um, the committee invites speakers to present in person or via Zoom, and members of the public may also submit information for the committee to consider. And I will tell you how that's done. As it, as it gathers information, the committee will also begin deliberating about how to best address their task. And then later they will begin drafting a report. So when the draft report is complete, the document will be reviewed and the committee must revise the report as needed in response to the reviewer comments. The National Academy's Report Review Committee determines if the reviewer comments have been appropriately addressed and approves the report for release. The final report is then delivered to the sponsor and made publicly available. So it's actually a, a long process. The review is rigorous. And I just want to make a few notes here. So when we do the report dissemination, we provide a copy of the report at the uh, at nap.edu. This is the National Academies Press website. And we also do a public webinar. And also a comment about meetings. So meetings are called open, open sessions when the committee hears from invited speakers and the public can attend or listen in. So the one we have today, this is a public meeting. It's an open session because we have people who are not on the committee. But committee also can meet in closed session to discuss its task and how to best address it. And during this closed session, only the committee and the staff are present. And then any time between the beginning of the project or the study and the end, the public has the opportunity to provide feedback or comment uh, via our study or via our study or project website. Okay, so next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we are given a, a task and it is written in this thing we call statement of task or SOT. So for this particular committee, um, CDFA requested that we can we could we convene an ad hoc committee to provide guidance on grapevine disease research to the CDFA PD Guiz Board. And actually, we are we 
we're requested to carry out three interrelated activities. So the first one is the review of proposals that were submitted to the PDGWIS board. Activity two is a critique of their RFP. And activity three is the focus of our meeting today, um, review of current knowledge on grapevine viruses, GRBV and GLRAV3 research outcomes, gaps in future research approach. Okay, so next slide, please. This is the rest of the statement of task, and I know it's pretty long. And in the interest of time, I will just say that if you go to the project website, the full statement of task is there. Okay, and speaking of which, can you go to the next slide? This is how the project or the study website looks like. So over here, you will find information about the committee members. We have their bios there. We have the statement of task. And also we have um, announcements of upcoming events like meetings or, or if we're gonna have webinars, it will be announced. So if you want to follow our study, you can subscribe. Or if you want to send a comment, you can click on this teeny tiny thing underneath the nice photo. It's circled there. You can click on that one and then it will let you um, send us your comment or feedback. Or you can send us an email. My email is there. I am Camila. And our senior program assistant is Sam. Okay, and next slide. I just want to briefly go over our timeline. So this uh, study started early this year and it will end December of next year. And so far, those these boxes on the left, we have done those already. So the for the activity one, we released the report on May, May 4. And then activity two, which is the RFP critique, we are planning to do a public release early July. So here on the right, where we have the purple boxes, this is what we're going to start to work on. And this is the, the first meeting under this activity three. And with that, uh, Matt, your, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Camilla. Uh, here we go. Okay, uh, there it should show up on the screen for you now. And uh, yes, I just want to give uh, or was asked to give just a little bit of background about the uh, uh, PDGWIS board and uh, kind of the existing process that's used for uh, research and kind of how how we got to um, how we got to this point. Uh, so the uh, I think well, I toggle the slides a different way here. All right, there we go. Uh, so the Pierce's Disease Control Program. Uh, again, it's you know I I have to give some context before we can get into viruses just to uh, sort of see how this fits together. Um, the the program was really started in response to a, a threat to wine grapes in California in uh, uh, 1999, basically with uh, uh, pictures on the right. Uh, which is what uh, uh, Temecula uh, looked like after a kind of a explosive outbreak of glassy wing sharpshooter, uh, which was introduced to California from the southeastern U.S. Uh, prior to then, Pierce's disease was endemic to California, but uh, largely manageable, or you know, would would pop up in sort of a kind of known uh, areas. And this new vector just presented a a totally uh, game-changing uh, situation for the landscape, just because it could. Uh, fly much further and had a much wider host range and seemed to uh, be happy pretty much anywhere and and uh, spreading the disease. So the the program was uh, uh, initiated. So the kind of heart of our program is a lot of uh, uh, there's regulatory aspects to the movement of nursery stock, uh, uh, bulk citrus. There's uh, uh, treatments and inspections in in areas where GWIS doesn't exist. Um, there's biocontrol releases in places where it does. Um, and, and overall, it's been a very cooperative program between the, uh, the industry in California, the wine grape industry particularly, and also the uh, uh, government, both federal government. Uh, within California, we also have the county agricultural commissioners, which is a unique system of 
kind of uh, the, our boots on the ground that are doing a lot of the actual uh, trapping and nursery stock enforcement. Um, so part of the industry oversight of that program is this Pierce's Disease and Glossary and Sharpshooter Board. Uh, it, it was formed in 2001 uh, and includes 14 members that represent the major wine grape growing regions of the state, as well as one uh, public member who's historically been a representative of the nursery industry, uh, just because they're uh, very much affected by some of the, the uh, regulatory uh, stuff associated with the movement of nursery stock uh, for the program. Um, the board also holds joint meetings with a, uh, another state body uh, called the Pierce's Disease Advisory Task Force. Um, that's another group that includes uh, a few uh, county agricultural commissioners from uh, Southern California, the San Joaquin Valley, and Napa, uh, representatives from the citrus and table grape industries, uh, as well as scientists and some other experts. Um, that that advisory task force doesn't have a uh, budget themselves, but their uh, kind of critical expertise contributes to the the discussion and overall oversight of the program and uh, and to their joint meetings. Um, the The board budget is based on uh, and and what the board has oversight over is uh, uh, they make rep they make recommendations to the uh, uh, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture on the use of funds. That are collected through an industry assessment. So this assessment that is paying for uh, all the board's activities and this project uh, comes from uh, crushed grapes uh, each year at harvest. The rate is set by the board. Uh, uh, again, this year it will be set at uh, uh, or was recommended to be set at a dollar twenty-five per thousand dollars of value for the 2023 harvest. So. For every thousand dollars worth of crushed grapes that are crushed into juice uh, uh, for use in juice or wine, dollar uh, uh, twenty-five of that is uh, uh, collected for this program. So over the life of the program, uh, California growers have uh, paid in uh, over eighty-three million dollars uh, over twenty-one uh, years, and this largely funds uh, research and some other activities related to uh, uh, Pierce's disease uh, response and control, but but a, a large chunk of that is research. So how we get from uh, Pierce's disease to talking about viruses, uh, starting in 2010, when European grapevine moth was introduced as a, uh, uh, became a, a, or was introduced to California in Northern California and was a serious threat to the industry, the board having already uh, being in place and having good networking within industry uh, the statute that defines the board's scope was uh, expanded to allow for a uh, specific process by which other pests or diseases could be designated for uh, use of assessment funds for research and outreach activities. Uh, so that started in 2010 with, uh, with EGBM. Uh, and then really around 2014 and 2015 was when uh, the, the three viruses that the board can fund research and outreach on, a red blotch, leaf roll, and fan leaf, uh, as well as mealybugs. Uh, that's listed twice because it, it started out as vine mealybug in 2014 and then in 2015 was expanded to include uh, all mealybug pests of wine grapes, uh, both as, as, uh, as vectors of uh, viral diseases and as pests in their own right. Um, and then finally, most recently, spotted lanternfly was added for the first time a pest before it had actually reached California was added to the list and that allowed for the, the use of assessment funds for some uh, outreach activities to try to uh, uh, spread the word and, and help with early detection efforts. There we go. Uh, so the uh, getting into the research, uh, research projects are selected through an annual request for proposals that's open every year from December through January. Um, applicants must be from nonprofit institutions, so that's written into the, the statute about what uh, what the board can use with assessment funds. Uh, so, such as universities or uh, other groups that uh, that can partner with somebody who who can do research uh, as part of a nonprofit institution. Um, proposals are reviewed by uh, scientific review panels uh, that are made up of uh, external volunteer subject matter experts, um, and then goes to um, as I mentioned before during the introductions, a research screening committee. Um, so the, the scientific reviewers will score the proposals by the categories in the RFP. 
and provide written comments. The research screening committee will then review those scores and comments and the proposals themselves and uh, uh, ultimately then make a recommendation to the full PDGWIS board uh, who will then make a, a recommendation to the to the secretary usually, usually in April. So the RFP is open from December to January. Uh, decisions made sometime around April for new projects that start uh, generally uh, in July. Um, I will mention uh, maybe different from some other uh, research programs, there isn't a set quota or funding allocation in advance of each funding cycle. Uh, so the board has some discretion um, uh, and ability to kind of respond to what quality and quantity of proposals are received in a given year. So if, if there's a particularly uh, a year that has a, a large number of exceptionally strong proposals, they may elect to fund more projects that year than, than they had in years prior. Um, and, and, and then, you know, just uh, adjust accordingly. Um, again, with the ability to, to also change the assessment rate year to year based on uh, fiscal needs of the, uh, of the board and, and of their research and outreach program. I'll mention also the applicants uh, do receive all the uh, written scientific reviewer comments after the decisions are made. Um, so they, they get, uh, uh, you know, fairly detailed and, and we try to aim for uh, having the reviewers give them as, as constructive as comments as possible um, so that they can, uh, both for folks that are funded and not funded, but especially those that are not, if, if there's uh, improvements that they can make and reapply the next year, then, then they're, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, I'll mention also here, so uh, much of this process, um, as well as the priorities of the Research Screening Committee, are really based on that National Academy of Sciences review that was uh, that Camilla mentioned from that was finished and published in 2004 uh, for Pierce's disease and GWIS. Now these other paths have been tagged onto this over time, um, but the the general structure of the process uh, and the program is is uh, largely reflected of some of that early uh, early guidance. And I'd, I'll speak to also just a couple examples of uh, research successes that we had out of the uh, kind of long-term vision that we got out of the National Academies review the first time around um, uh, was, uh, uh, for example, now just a couple years ago, uh, or as of a couple years ago, we have uh, five conventionally bred Pierce's disease resistant grapes on the market that were the product of a, a very long running uh, uh, resistance breeding program, conventional breeding program, uh, to get those to get those grapes out, and now they're out, and and uh, wine is being made from them, uh, and and they're being used in areas that uh, uh, historically were very problematic for Pierce's disease, uh, such as riparian areas or, or other spots that are just hard to grow grapes otherwise because of the disease pressure. Um, other kind of long-term things that have come out of that, um, there's there's been a long-running research program uh, using. Uh, uh, transgenics, as well as other gene editing uh, tools and exploring those for uh, Pierce's disease and other uh, uh, diseases in the RFP uh, with the realization that the regulatory hurdles that those, that those may, go, may go through before they would be accepted or released, you know, uh, if ever, uh, might be high, but the board's always taken the approach of investing in the best science and keeping the best options open um, uh, with with an eye towards the future and and kind of keeping one eye uh, to the to the long road. Um, I was asked also just to kind of briefly cover some uh, history of funding from the uh, from the research from the board. So just this past year in in from the uh, 2023 cycle, that's uh, basically projects that will be uh, starting next month. Um, 17 uh, proposals were uh, ultimately funded out of 31 that were received. Uh, that totaled about $2.7 million uh, total. Uh, the projects were for one to three years. Um, there's another 10 projects that were multi-year projects that have been funded in years prior that were continuing this year as well. And again, over the, over the life of the board since 2001, there's been $55 million invested in research. Um, again, that uh, is a little bit short of the total amount that's been collected from wine grape growers, again, because some of this is used for uh, outreach activities, as well as some Pierce's disease control activities that aren't reflected in this research. But this is the, the majority of the 83 million that I mentioned before. Um, since 2001, there have been uh, 282 grants funded by the board. 
uh, with about 42 and a half million for Pierce's disease and its vectors. And uh, since 2010, uh, uh, about 12 and a half million for other pests and diseases. Um, just looking at uh, the, the viruses and their, and their, and mealybugs, uh, which we kind of lump together just because of the connection some of them has a, have as vectors. Um, the uh, research allocation over time since 2015, when the virus research really uh, started, uh, has been about one third uh, for uh, virus and mealybug funding and uh, uh, over that period, although in recent years, it's actually been closer to, to half or a little bit more than half for, for viruses and mealybugs. Um, averaging about 3.1 million uh, per year since 2015 and, and about 1.3 million of that for, uh, uh, for viruses or mealybugs. Um, and then also just kind of splitting it out by topic, the board on average receives uh, 23 proposals a year, um, although this year we had uh, an uptick, which was uh, quite nice. Um, so uh, averaging 23 proposals and, and 14 of those funded per year. Uh, just about half of those are for uh, these other pests and diseases. Again, the the majority of which are related to uh, related to viruses, except for a couple uh, early on projects related to PGVM and brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and uh, right from just uh, as as a as a disclaimer from the breakdown here, you know, of course, there's projects that deal with multiple pests from time to time. So uh, of the numbers here, there are some marked as leaf roll that you know may also touch on uh, mealybugs as a vector, particularly for, um, uh, yeah, particularly for leaf roll. Um, and I'll just touch briefly on uh, public outreach because that kind of plays into, you know, science communication and other activities that the board is involved in. Um, the, the board contracts with an outreach firm that releases uh, quarterly newsletters uh, that are sent out to uh, over 7,000 growers who are the folks that are actually paying the assessment, um, as well as other stakeholders. Uh, plus, they send out a monthly e-newsletter uh, to an additional 1,200 farmers, industry groups, uh, elected officials, and others. Um, their research updates are regularly or are featured in uh, every newsletter and uh, uh, many of these uh, materials that, that come out. Uh, they also have a, a presence at a lot of uh, uh, trade shows or other uh, industry meetings, a Facebook page with updates, and a, a YouTube channel that includes some scientists talking about their work. Um, it's really been a, a goal to make the, uh, or to help the industry and the uh, sort of regular grape growers that are uh, paying into this and, and seeing it come out of what they get from the, uh, you know, what they get from their processor who buys their grapes uh, to uh, try to understand and see where that money is going um, as, a, as a transparently and as accessibly as possible. So we're always looking for ways to uh, make, that, uh, make that work more, more approachable and accessible. Um, and that's uh, about all I had. So I'll just, uh, again, thank you all for your time and, and work on this project. Um, anybody with questions about our, our program in general or the board itself, uh, welcome to, we have our general email there as well as our uh, mainline phone number. Um, and uh, lots of uh, this information and more is uh, on our website as well. So uh, thank you all. Sam, can you share the the last slide, which has the um, questions that um, Matt and Chris will be addressing? We can get started, Matt, if you're ready to go. It's the last one, the last one, well, last one. Yes. yes. Do you see my screen? Yes, yeah, looks good. Thank you. And I think between the two of us, I, I've done a lot of talking. I can, Chris, I can let you take the, the first yeah. question. We can kind of bounce back and forth as, uh, uh, as needed. Huh. That sounds great. Yeah, I can go ahead and get started with um with question number one. So why did we why did we um, commission this study and um why did we choose the National Academies? Well, as Matt mentioned, we've made some some pretty good progress as an industry with Pierce's disease. Our original 
focus our original problem, why the board was formed. Um, compared to where we were when we started, we now have an effective Pierce's disease control program. We have Pierce's disease resistant varieties. We have really detailed knowledge on the epidemiology of the disease. Um, we know about PD resistant gene sources and we might actually soon have several biocontrol curative products out there. So a lot of strides have been made since the original study. And I think there are less unknowns about that system with all the research, great research that continues to be done. But with viruses, um, while we also know a lot about some aspects of different epidemiologies of leaf roll and red blotch, as an industry, we are really still struggling with effective control strategies. So for leaf roll virus, for example, I mean, we know a single crawler can spread the virus within an hour. We know that, but that's just too fast for any sort of knockdown vector control strategy. Um, so even when vector populations are very low, we see spread. We don't have any resistance within Vitus that we have taken advantage of, um, at least for host plant resistance. For red blotch, uh, we have one known vector, but and, and a pretty inefficient one. Um, and we have knowledge gaps about where it overwinters, how to effectively can effectively control it. Even do we still do we need to? And so for both viruses, growers are really told to identify infected vines and remove them, which is not really sustainable. Um, and in many growers' opinions, it's not working. So we really need a broad view of what information we have as an industry and what we're missing to develop some novel controls. Um, as for why choosing the National Academies, we embarked on a wonderfully successful project with you in the past. <laughs> I read that report when I started this position as a research coordinator, as well as the more recent study um, done with the Florida Citrus Board on um, HLB. And there were some great parallels. And I just thought that this would be <laughs> a great way for us to get that broad view from um, a wide range of experts in your fields. Anything I missed, Matt? <laughs> Why are we no, doing this? I I think that pretty well covers it. I think also the, uh, yeah, the, uh, just the uh, uh, respect and notoriety around the National Academies and, and uh, uh, you know, it can help attract attention also to this issue from uh, folks that maybe aren't uh, currently uh, involved or maybe involved in virology, but not grapevine virology or other, uh, you know, just attract more people to to this uh, issue and realizing that this is a, you know, that these are real challenges that uh, uh, that would be you know, essential to get some uh, to get some research progress on and, and, and just try to attract attention to the issue. Yeah. Are there any follow up questions for that one? No, okay. Great, yeah, just stop me anytime. Um, so question two, how will we use the results uh, from this study? Um, well, I know we're focusing today on task three, but I can, you are also have recently reviewed our RFP and our proposals. And I mean, changes to our RFP process could be, could certainly be done and useful for us to cast a wider net when it comes to funding research. Um, or you know, the field of grape virology is full of fantastic scientists, uh, but it is small and we see proposals from a relatively few numbers of them. So there may be more opportunities out there for collaboration um, and even maybe across commodity groups. And so we just really like to explore how that might be possible um, within our current RFP and the funding process. For task three, which we're focused on today, it will be very helpful to concretely identify our knowledge gaps so we can think about how to tackle them from a scientific research perspective, uh, be it like soliciting specific proposals from specific scientists, funding some sort of large collaborative project with specific objectives once those are de defined. Um, should we be prioritizing some types of studies over others within our proposal selection process? Uh, those are the sort of things that came to mind when I was thinking about this question. Anything you have to add, Matt? I think I think you covered it well, Chris. It, it's 
really just this uh yeah hope to uh Im improve our process and you know uh, help us understand or help the help the industry understand and help us as a program uh tailor our uh, both our rfp and selection process and outreach that we're doing to try to ensure that we're getting the best um uh the the best research and the best use of of uh, grower dollars uh to to fund that research yeah any follow-up questions on that okay great um so types of recommendations that would be the most least helpful um so for the most helpful not only our knowledge gaps but what types of research would help fill them um what are we missing <laughs> and how to perhaps bridge the gap between research and application that is something the board's been very interested in sometimes we have some great research ideas and then yeah they they yield they yield something that might not end up in a in an application i know not all research goes that way but how to help bridge that gap would be would be of interest um outreach is a, a requirement for all of our research projects we fund um but is is that enough um or is more needed um which research areas are most likely to lead to finding practical solutions <laughs> to slowing virus spread in grower fields I think that's the big big one that we would really really love some insight on um and really removing viruses from our kind of plant material pipeline what interference opportunities are we missing um are there new technologies used in other crops that we are not using that may potentially have promise um one thing I thought of is you know in looking at our funded work um are there resources that our research community lack to effectively study viruses at the detail needed? How, how it, potentially, how could these be overcome? Um, one thing I very much liked about the original study in 2004 was the identification of areas of study that might lead to advances in control in the short term versus long term. I would like to start thinking about our research portfolio that way um, to make sure we have kind of a, a, a balanced approach. And not we're not just you know we do fund basic science and sometimes that's where it needs to start but a, wi a wide range of studies and for the least helpful i'm not really sure um i suppose we're not, i'm not we're not just looking for a reiteration of what we know we don't know <laughs> like are there more vectors for red blotch we we have researchers trying to answer those questions um where do the three-cornered alfalfa hopper trees or the tree hoppers over winter. We have research, you know, so just something a bit more, more, more detailed. Um, Matt, anything, anything else you could think of for a helpful recommendations or least helpful? No, but just echoing that, that the, the the structure and the format of the of the review that was that was done, you know, now going on twenty years ago. Um, but that really was uh, well uh, uh, laid out and I think helpful for the program and especially that kind of helping find a balance between, okay, some real applied solutions that might work in the short term to kind of shore up the management, you know, which, as Chris said, is largely just testing and pulling vines, which, yeah, is is not sustainable with the with the disease spread rates that we're seeing in places. Um, uh, and, and then that also, so Im improvements there, yeah, great but uh, and then also the the but balancing that with the long term stuff um about sort of what you know is is uh you know resistance something you know worth pursuing or is that something that's just so uh sort of un unthinkable for uh, uh for viruses that we just you know need to think about other um uh, other tactics so just uh those kind of balancing the the long term and the short term is uh will be really helpful yeah, really agree. Okay. Um, so moving on to question four. Um, yeah, this one was a little hard for me as well, but uh, one thing that came up actually just recently at a board meeting uh, that might be outside the statement of task is um, there are some groups that feel we have a need to understand potential ch challenges within our nursery industry regarding viruses and maintaining virus 
free plant material all the way through. So for our nursery industry, uh, our nurseries are not indoors or necessarily exclusively in greenhouses or greenhouses, as I understand it's the case with other crops. They're outside, sometimes next to other vineyards, next to other agriculture fields. Um, it's hard to grow the quantity of grapevines the industry needs in a small area. So that, that's a challenge that some people have recognized that might be contributing to some of our issues for viruses. Uh, I, but I think a complete review of our clean plant network is outside of this statement of task, although we would certainly be open to opinions about it and comments as to its relevance to our issues overall. That's really the only thing I could I could think of. Um, did you have anything else that came to mind, Matt? No, I I didn't have anything. Um, I did. Well, no, I'll get I'll get to that at the end. So no, I didn't have anything else for that. Okay. Um, and then the parts of the statement of task for activity three that are the most important um, and why. Uh, for me, novel ideas about future research approaches. So as a committee, you guys have expertise in numerous crop species, many different families of insect vectors, uh, different viral pathogens, um, lots that lots of crossover with grape, but but some completely different systems as well. So what can the PDQIS board learn from that, um, learn from you, and how can we translate it to evolve our request for proposals and funding process? I also think you know a comprehensive review of the literature for us for leaf roll type three and red blotch will be very valuable to have. Um, especially perhaps an international perspective. There's no um, specific reason why we don't tend to fund, why we don't fund international researchers, but we haven't. Uh, those could be some, there could be some interesting opportunities there if those recommendations were made. Um, those were the main two that came to mind for me. Have anything to add, Matt? Just a discussion point that had you know had come up along the while as as we were you know first talking about this and putting it together is just yeah if there if there's ways or ideas that we can get people to talk to each other that aren't currently talking to each other and making connections between uh, as you know Chris said you all you know having you know all being very well versed in virology but you know also having you know connections to other uh, fields uh, and uh, other you know, collaborators, colleagues, and just ways to sort of make, yeah, you know, make, make connections and maybe spur some other uh, ideas about, you know, ways of uh, uh, getting new ideas into this, into this space. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the kind of information that we have or could provide that would help the committee. Well, obviously, certainly lists of all the proposals we have funded a Hun virus and the report since we started. Matt outlined that about just nine years now, or two, since 2014 to 15. Um, but that is certainly not a complete history, especially compared to work on leaf roll type three. Um, and we certainly have lists and knowledge of um, industry and academic contacts that would be helpful to interview or talk to to gain different industry perspectives on our virus funding process and um, viral issues in the industry. I'm not sure what other types of information would be helpful, but anything that you guys can think of, if we can pull pull it together, we, we absolutely will. Um, yeah, absolutely. Any, uh, any questions about the, the uh, our processes, you know, on the back end with the, with the RFP, or as Chris said, the, you know, history of funding projects, uh, uh, progress reports on past reports that the board has funded, um, and uh, yeah, any uh, anything else, yeah, we'd be uh, happy to, to make any of that stuff uh, uh, available. I'll mention, I guess now I'll mention, uh, the uh, PDGWIS board being a, a, a basically state-appointed body in California, all of their meetings are open meetings uh, all of the information that uh, uh, generally, uh, all of the uh, projects and the, the reports that uh, uh, researchers uh, produce uh, do are, you know, 
uh, either are or can be made publicly available. Uh, so that there's um, generally, uh, everything is very open. Now that goes the other way uh, as well. So uh, anything that is going to be shared uh, in almost any case uh, with the PDQuist board also needs to be made uh, publicly available. So um, all of their handouts at their public meetings, um, you know, they're, uh, it's, it's open meetings, but in, in California, that means very open. So all of the handouts, uh, all of the everything goes to uh, uh, everybody who wants it. So um, that's uh, part of a, a consideration. If there's uh, specific stuff about or, or questions or information that needs to go back and forth to the program directly, um, that stuff can go through Chris and I. We can, you know, handle that and, and you know, talk about whatever. But um, things that, uh, uh, you know, will ultimately be uh, shared with, uh, or if we're going to share anything with uh, uh, board members, uh, then it would sort of, it would then end up being publicly available. So, um, uh, for example, the first uh, report that was publicly available that was shared with our board members as a uh, as a handout, the the public version. Uh, as a handout at our at our last meeting uh, earlier this week. Yes. Okay, and then for the last one, um, how did the CDFA use the recommendations in the, the prior report from 2004? I think Matt already covered this pretty well. It um, helped us to really focus research on some long-term projects that led to some sustainable solutions for for Pierce's disease that we now have as an industry, um, helped set a lot of the scientific rigor and guidelines behind our RFP and our, and our funding process that we still use today. Um, so that has all been very important. And also our assessment funds um, come up for a vote every five years, I, I believe. And um, we want the industry to know that we are very serious about the academic rigor behind this program. And I think involving the National Academy of Sciences really, really lends to that as well. Hey, I think that's it for me. Any questions or any other comments? Anything else I can help with? <laughs> Anna? Well, first off, I'd like to thank you, Matt and Chris. This has been really informative for me. I have like several pages of notes <laughs> from what you just provided. And I think it, it really like um, informs me um, and the rest of the committee about um, what what are your initiatives and really what is our main, the main goal of the work. Um, I, I think we only have like two or three minutes. I, I don't want to take up all the time, but does anyone else on the committee have um, additional questions that you wanted to ask? Um, this is Tom. I'll ask one while we have everyone. I am curious how the board arrives at the total assessment amount. How do they decide what's the right amount of funds to assign to research given the risk the industry takes and the value of the crop? Yeah, the, the assessment rate itself is uh, uh, set every year, uh, this time of year, as I said, they had a meeting earlier this week. So um, at that point, we'll look at for the upcoming state fiscal year, what their projected expenses and and uh, uh, carryover are, and then set an assessment sort of a, accordingly, also taking into consideration what, you know, the, the board is made up of people that are paying the assessment. So they're, they're interested in having that, uh, uh, you know, money be, be, used for the, the best use possible. Um, generally, uh, as I said, there isn't a set funding allocation going into each RFP cycle, but there, you know, they'll oftentimes kind of take into consideration, okay, how much has been funded in the past for, you know, uh, this, that, or the other, but, but it really comes down to kind of what, what scores well, what kind of comments we get from the, from the reviewers and what's, uh, what seems like the the most promising or highest quality proposals received that year? Um, well, thanks, Matt and Chris. I think we have a big challenge ahead of us, but I think um, we have a great team assembled. We're really up for the challenge of thinking about the best ways to develop those, come up with ideas for those short-term and long-term solutions, and facilitating collaboration between researchers. 
maybe even non-traditional people that you wouldn't think of so that would study wine grapes. Um, and we have that important goal of helping you um, make sure that California wine grapes are have maintain their excellence and productivity in the future. So we're looking forward to working with you guys and, and developing a great report. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all very much. Thanks everyone, it's four o'clock. So we're gonna close this session. Have a good weekend. And for the committee members, we're not gonna start the weekend yet. We're gonna move over to the closed session and discuss some takeaways. Thank you, Matt and Chris. Uh, we will be in touch if we have other questions or we are if we need other uh, the information that you could provide us. I will let you know when we need it and we will go from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great weekend. Bye. -bye. Thank you.